Hello YouTube, so in this video I'm going to outline a recent argument for moral realism, the ontological argument for moral realism. This was presented by Michael Humer in his paper An Ontological Proof of Moral Realism, and the basic idea is that from the mere possibility that moral realism is true, we can infer that moral realism is actually true. Uh, of course, this is inspired by the ontological argument for God, which tries to show that from the mere possibility that God exists, we can infer that God actually exists. Um, of course, before getting to that, I need to do a quick advert. You can support me on Patreon or by giving a one-off donation on PayPal. If you are interested in private tutoring, please send me an email and also join the Discord. Um, and there will be links to all of that in the description. Okay, with that out of the way, let's look at Humor's argument. So first of all, we need to clarify what exactly is meant by moral realism. Um, of course, there are different forms of moral realism. Well, Hume's argument is framed in terms of moral reasons. Um, so moral theories will specify reasons for action. For example, the fact that slavery causes suffering um, or the fact that slavery deprives people of liberty, these things are reasons not to own slaves, according to most moral theories. You know, if you ask a utilitarian, um, a utilitarian will say the fact that slavery causes suffering, that is a reason not to own slaves. Um, so <clears throat> what Humor is going to argue is that there are objective moral reasons. Um, and moral reasons have two features, as Humor defines them. First of all, moral reasons are non-selfish. When an agent has a moral reason for an action, the reason is not based simply on what would satisfy the agent's own interests or the agent's own welfare. Uh, indeed, it may be that the right thing to do is contrary to your own interests. For example, uh, maybe you are morally obligated to give large sums of your money to charity. That's not going to make you personally better off. The reason why you are obligated to do this has to do with the welfare of other people, not just yourself. Moral reasons are about how you act with regard to others. Second, moral reasons are categorical. This is to say that these reasons hold independently of the agent's own desires. Um, consider, for example, the moral claim that you ought not to own slaves. So as we said, the fact that slavery causes suffering uh, is a reason not to own slaves. Well, even if owning slaves satisfies your desires, uh, you still have a reason not to own slaves. Even if you personally don't care about the suffering of others, um, that still constitutes a reason not to own slaves. Um, to, like the fact that slavery causes suffering, that alone is going to constitute a reason not to own slaves. That, that makes it immoral not to own slaves. So basically, um, this is to say that moral reasons at least as the moral realist conceives of them, are stance independent. They obtain independently of your own interests, desires and values. And Humer's argument aims to show that there are moral reasons in this sense. There are reasons for action that are non-selfish and categorical. Okay, a second point to clarify is that Humer's argument is going to involve assigning probabilities to claims. And in this case, Humer is invoking epistemic probability. Uh, where he says, I quote, the epistemic probability of a proposition is a measure of the degree of justification the proposition has in light of one's current evidence. So if we're talking about the epistemic probability of a proposition, we are asking um, how, pro like, how probable is this proposition given the current evidence? Uh, or like, what credence should I have in the, in the proposition? How confident should I be in this proposition? There are, of course, other ways of thinking about probability. Um, so we might say that there are objective probabilities. Uh, like, I don't know, the probability that an atom will decay in the next 10 minutes, right? There's like some, we might think there's some fact of the matter about the probability that an atom will decay in the next 10 minutes. And that, that's a kind of objective probability that is independent of our beliefs and evidence. Um, but that's not the kind of probability that's relevant to Humer's argument. When Humer is talking about probability, and when we talk about probability in this video, we're going to mean epistemic probability. So how confident should we be in the truth of a proposition, given our evidence? I mean, and we can ask, you know, what is the epistemic probability of moral realism? Um, of course, moral realism is either true or false. But, um, you know, we 
we can assess the evidence and we, we're not going to be like absolutely certain whether it's true or false, right? We're going to assign a probability to it. We're going to have a particular credence in its truth or falsehood. Um, Anti-realists obviously are going to say, well, moral realism is false. So they're going to assign a low epistemic probability to it. Maybe I think that, you know, I don't know, I, I have a credence of like, you know, 5% or something in, in moral realism. But notice that even for a... Um, for a moral anti-realist, you're probably not going to assign, like, a probability of zero, um, because moral realism is controversial. Um, it isn't, or at least this is what Hume would say, moral realism is not obviously incoherent or obviously absurd. There are many intelligent, rational people across a range of disciplines who have defended moral realism. Uh, in fact, currently the majority of meta-ethicists, so the majority of people who specialise in the assessment of claims uh, like moral realism, the majority of them accept moral realism. So if moral realism is false, it's going to be false for non-obvious reasons. And so for any kind of rational inquirer, moral realism should have a non-zero epistemic probability. Um, a, a rational inquirer should grant that, given our current evidence, moral realism might be true. Like, even if you think it is false, like even if that's where you are inclined to stand, you should recognise, you know what, I might be mistaken. Um, maybe I'm mistaken, maybe moral realism is going to turn out to be true. Um, okay, so this kind of gives a bit of background to Hume's argument. Hopefully that kind of clarifies um, a couple of things. With that said, we can, we can outline the argument. And the argument comes in essentially three steps. The first step is uh, what Hume calls the probabilistic reasons principle. And the probabilistic reasons principle says, essentially it says, that if some proposition P would, if you knew it, provide a reason to do X, then your having a reason to believe that P might be true also provides you a reason to do X. So a, a small epistemic probability for P provides a small, uh, you know, reason for action, basically. Um, to illustrate this, Humer gives the example of buying a lottery ticket. Let's say Verity wants to be rich, and she's considering buying a lottery ticket. Now, clearly, if she knew that the ticket she's considering, if she knew that that ticket would win, that would definitely give her a reason to buy the ticket. You know, buying the ticket would satisfy her desire to be rich. Of course, she doesn't know the ticket will win. In fact, she expects it will lose. But there is some chance that the ticket will win. There is, you know, maybe a tiny chance, but there's still some chance the ticket will win. So there is some reason to believe that the ticket will win. There's some small reason to, to think that it will, in fact, win, because there is a chance that it will win. And this gives her some reason, perhaps a very small reason, to buy the ticket. Um, it, it's a fact that counts in favour of her buying the ticket. Now, this reason for buying the ticket might be outweighed by other reasons. Maybe the, you know, I mean, it's because we're also got to consider the cost of the ticket. We've got to consider the chance of winning. Maybe when you think about the cost of the ticket and you think about the chance of winning, well, um, that's too high. The cost is too high for it to be worth it. But imagine, you know, writing a list, right? So you've got two columns where you, you put reasons to buy the ticket and reasons not to buy the ticket. Well, the first column, the reasons to buy the ticket column, that's not going to be empty, right? The fact that the ticket has some small chance of winning, that does count in favour of buying it. Um, so it is, you know, that is a reason to buy the ticket. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is the, the probabilistic reasons principle. In fact, I think we apply the, the probabilistic reasons principle uh, in all kinds of, of everyday contexts. Um, so, you know, let's say that Sydney wants to watch a film. Um, obviously, he wants to have a positive experience while watching the film, but he has fairly high aesthetic standards. So he doesn't actually enjoy watching most films. For, for most of the films he selects, um, you know, he, he, his expectation is that he's not going to enjoy it. Um, but still, you know, so if he's sort of thinking about a f what film to watch, um, you know, when when he kind of selects a particular film, he can say, well, yeah, I'm probably not going to enjoy it. But still, he can say, you know, if I knew that I would enjoy this film, that would certainly give me a reason to watch watch the film. And I do have some reason to believe that I will enjoy the film because, you know, I do enjoy some films. Um, and so, like, even if he expects that the film will be terrible, he's open to the epistemic possibility that he will enjoy it. Um, and so 
that gives him a reason to watch the film. Um, now, the probabilistic reasons principle also applies to moral reasons. Let's say that Delia is at a restaurant and is considering ordering lamb chops, but there are many arguments that it is wrong to eat meat. Many people think that meat eating is seriously wrong. Now, Delia isn't convinced of these arguments, and she indeed she is inclined to the view that it's okay to eat meat, but you know, I mean, she's not absolutely sure about that. Uh, she takes the arguments for veganism very seriously. Um, you know, like the, the, the arguments are kind of difficult to resist. If, if meat eating is acceptable, it is acceptable for non-obvious reasons, right? Um, so the thought is, well, you know, if, if Delia knew with certainty that meat eating is wrong, then obviously that would be a reason for her not to order the lamb chops. As it happens, Delia is merely unsure whether meat-eating is wrong. Uh, that also gives her a reason not to order lamb chops. It, you know, it counts in favour of refraining from ordering lamb chops and instead ordering something that she is sure is morally acceptable. Because, like, it, so if she's kind of, kind of on the fence, or even if she's, you know, leaning towards meat-eating and being okay, but she recognises, hey, maybe meat-eating is wrong, um, you know, like, um, that's going to count in favour of refraining from eating meat, um, because she kind of recognises that, you know, she might be wrong, um, she might be mistaken um, about the acceptability of meat eating, and uh, she doesn't want to uh, do things that are morally wrong. Um, okay then, so so that's kind of the, the general idea of the probabilistic reasons principle. Humour gives a more precise formulation of this principle as follows. So he says, the probabilistic reasons principle more precisely speaking, is the following. If the following conditions hold, A. If S knew that P, this would provide, provide a reason for S to do X. B. If S knew that not P, this would provide no reason for S not to do X. And C. S has some reason to believe that P, however slight, then it follows from these three conditions that S has a reason to do X. So when the truth of P supports doing x, and the falsity of p does not oppose doing x, then if there's any chance at all that p might be true, that gives you some reason to do x. And, I mean, obviously that reason might be outweighed by the reasons not to do x, but even so, you, there's still a reason to do x. And this probabilistic reasons principle is supposed to be a general constraint on rationality. It isn't concerned with moral reasons in particular. So when you're weighing up what is prudentially the best for you to do. If you're asking, okay, like, what, like, how should I best promote my own interests? You're going to apply the probabilistic reasons principle. When Sydney was thinking about watching a movie, well, that's not a, you know, that's not anything to do with morality. Similarly, when Verity was considering buying a lottery ticket, that's not a, a moral action, but they're applying the probabilistic reasons principle. So the thought is that anti-realists should accept this principle um, as well. So, um, so that's the first step. OK, the probabilistic reasons principle. All right, then now let's turn to the second step. This is what Humer calls the uh, the anti-torture argument. And Humer is here going to present an argument to the effect that you ought not to torture babies for fun. Um, in itself, this argument doesn't establish moral realism. Uh, after all, anti-realists can also endorse the claim that you ought not to torture babies. But the so the argument for moral realism is going to come in the third step. But um, you know, so we first of all have this anti-torture argument the for the claim that you ought not to torture babies. Okay, here's the argument. So the first premise is the probabilistic reasons principle. Um, and so it might be worth kind of going back and looking at exactly how the probabilistic reasons principle is phrased, um, because that's premise one, right? So what we just saw a couple of slides ago, that strict formulation where we had the uh, A, B and C conditions that's just stated in premise one, okay? So put that into premise one. Um, and then premise two, uh, and then in the rest of the premises, we apply um, the probabilistic reasons principle to uh, the action of baby torture. So premise two says, if we knew that torturing babies was objectively morally wrong, this would provide a reason to avoid torturing babies. Premise three, even if we knew that torturing babies was not objectively morally wrong, this in itself would provide no reason um, no reason to torture babies. Premise 
four, we have some reason to believe that torturing babies is objectively morally wrong. So premise five, we have a reason to avoid torturing babies. Um, again, premise this premise five here. Um, this is not the conclude. This is not the moral realist conclusion at this point. Obviously, an anti-realist can accept this. The moral realist conclusion is going to come later. Um, okay, so this is step two, the anti-torture argument. What might be said about this step? Well, what we're doing here is just applying the probabilistic reasons principle to the specific case of an obligation not to torture babies. Does the argument work? Well, um, I mean, premise three is probably uncontroversial. Uh, this premise just tells us that, so if baby torture is not objectively wrong, that doesn't in itself give us a reason to torture babies. I mean, that's probably fair enough, right? Like, you know, merely merely knowing that some alternative meta-ethical theory is correct, say, you know, merely knowing that non-cognitivism or error theory or whatever is correct, um, that wouldn't give, that wouldn't in itself give you, give you a reason to torture babies. Like, so if you if you knew, for instance, that there were no moral facts, that in itself is not going to be a reason to torture babies. The other two premises are a bit more tricky. So according to humour, premise two, um, so premise two is the claim, if we knew that torturing babies was objectively morally wrong, this would give us a reason to avoid torturing babies. According to humour, this premise is true by definition. Um, so the claim is that if X is objectively morally wrong, then we have a reason to avoid doing X just by the definition of what objectively wrong and reason mean. Objective wrongness constitutes a reason to avoid performing an action by like just by definition, right? If by definition, if you didn't have a reason to refrain from an action, it wouldn't be objectively wrong. So Humor says prem that premise two is true by definition. Now, this is, I think, probably going to be a bit controversial, right? Like an anti-realist might challenge the argument at this point. Um, premise two makes a claim about the relation between objective wrongness and reasons. It seems like a substantive claim, and it's, I mean, it raises the questions, well, what exactly is objective wrongness and what exactly are reasons? Now, both of these are subject to a great deal of debate. So let's start with this notion of objective wrongness. Well, there are many conceptions of what it is for something to be objectively wrong. For example, according to moral non-naturalists, objective wrongness is a non-natural, non-causal property that supervenes on natural properties. But now we might think, well, it's not obvious why our reasons for action would be dependent on such non-natural properties. I mean, at the very least, it seems perfectly reasonable to ask, you know, like, why would these non-natural properties provide reasons for action, right? Like that, that's a, like how, I mean, how? How could non-natural properties provide reasons for action? That seems like a perfectly coherent, perfectly sensible question. Um, so, you know, the thought is, well, we can't just insist that reasons for action are to be identified with these non-natural properties and then, you know, leave things at that. Some further argument is needed here. Um, you know, so sort of just to say, oh, well, you know, this, this second premise is, is true by definition. Like, it's true by definition that if X is objectively wrong, we have a reason to avoid doing X. I think you might say, well, hang on a minute. Um, like, it, but, it, but it seems an open question. Like, w why should we think that objective wrongness uh, conceived of in terms of non-natural properties provides a reason for action? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we might think that, that there's sort of further argument required here, and maybe this is one place an anti-realist could, um, you know, attack the argument. Uh, this kind of problem uh, becomes even more serious when we consider the available theories of reasons. Um, so there are many theories of what reasons are, of what it is to have a reason for action. Um, Consider, for example, a simple instrumentalist account of reason. According to, an in, according to instrumentalism, I have a reason to do X just in case X satisfies my desires. I have a reason to refrain from doing X just in case X frustrates my desires. So, like, when I say, you know, I have a reason to put on a coat, that's just saying that, like, what, what makes that true is that, um, you know, like, I have the desire to stay dry and putting on a coat is going to be the it's going to like allow me to remain dry and putting on a coat doesn't satisfy it doesn't frustrate any of my other desires so um the instrumentalist is going to treat reasons as dependent on desires and given this analysis of what reasons are it would be totally coherent to say that x is objectively morally wrong 
But even so, that in itself provides no reason to avoid doing X. It would only provide, the fact that X is objectively morally wrong, that would only provide a reason to avoid doing X if you have the desire to conform your behavior to the objective moral facts. But I might not have that desire. Indeed, I might be an immoralist. I might have the desire to act contrary to the moral facts. In which case, the fact that X is objectively morally wrong, that would actually give me a reason to do X. You know, like if I, if I want to, to do, if I want to be immoral, if I want to do immoral things, then the fact that X is objectively morally wrong, that would be a reason to do X, like if you accept instrumentalism. Um, and so, and, and notice that this is going to be the case. So, you know, I, I'm only going to have a desire, I'm only going to have a reason to avoid doing X if I have the desire to conform to the objective moral facts. If you accept instrumentalism, that's going to be the case no matter what view we take of what it is for something to be objectively morally wrong. Um, so, you know, humor, as, as I said, you know, he says, well, premise two is, is, is an analytic truth. It's just true by definition, right? It's true by definition that, um, <clears throat> that if X is objectively wrong, we have a reason to avoid doing X. Now, I mean, in some sense, it's perfectly acceptable to say this. Uh, after all, you can define words however you want. The trouble is that any anti-realist who endorses an instrumentalist account of reasons at this point will either just say that there are no reasons in human sense or they'll say that, you know, if there are reasons in human sense, this is not what is conventionally meant by the term reason or, or something like that. Um, you, you know, that, like so like, OK, Humer says premise two is true by definition, but then there are various competing analyses of the concept reason and not all of these analyses are going to make premise two come out as true by definition. So that might be um, so that 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 might be one uh, worry about this anti torture argument. Um, OK, then. So what about premise four, the claim that we have some reason to believe that torturing babies is objectively morally wrong? Well, the key point here is that moral realism might, for all we know, turn out to be true. Um, we can't rule out moral realism conclusively, as we have already mentioned. And, I mean, yeah, that's probably uncontroversial. I think most anti-realists would agree that moral realism is at least open as an epistemic possibility, right? Like, so, yeah, I mean, maybe, as an anti-realist, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe moral realism is going to turn out to be true. But notice that there's a bit more required before we accept premise four. In order to accept premise four, we require the additional assumption that if moral realism is true, then one of those things that is objectively morally wrong is baby torture. So premise four requires not just the bare possibility that moral realism is true, it also requires us uh, to think that if moral realism is true, we can assess which actions are morally right or wrong. So I can, I can assess you know, which actions would turn out to be morally right and morally wrong um, under the, you know, hypothetical that moral realism is true. So, I mean, as an anti-realist, I have to ask myself, like, if I came to believe that moral realism were true, what would I take the moral facts to be? And the assumption is that I would take it that one of the moral facts is that torturing babies is wrong. Um, now, I mean, on... on on the one hand, OK, there's some support for this. We might point out that, look, every moral theory that is taken seriously by philosophers entails that baby torture is wrong in, in the vast majority of circumstances. Um, and of course, as it happens, the vast majority of anti-realists hold a negative attitude towards torturing babies. Um, but the anti-realist might resist the claim that we are actually in any position to assess what the objective moral values would be. Um, in fact, this is already a popular anti-realist strategy. So consider, for example, evolutionary debunking arguments. I have a whole video on evolutionary debunking arguments, which I will link in the comments. Um, the evolutionary debunking argument is going to conclude that if there are moral facts, we cannot have any knowledge of what those facts are. So, so the general, there's a sort of general structure to evolutionary debunking arguments, which goes like this. So we have um, the first premise is that our evolutionary history explains why we have the moral beliefs that we do. Second premise is that evolution is not truth tracking with respect to the moral truths. And then the conclusion is that our moral beliefs are unjustified. 
Um, okay, so to elaborate a little bit more on this, the, the general idea is that um, our basic moral attitudes have been shaped by natural selection. And this means that they have been selected to promote survival and reproduction. So the reason why we have the moral attitudes that we do is because those attitudes promoted survival and reproduction among our ancestors. But this means that the truth of those moral attitudes plays no role in explaining why we evolved them. We would have evolved pretty much the same moral attitudes regardless of what the moral truths actually are. Um, so like, even if violence, cruelty, selfishness were good, we would still believe that violence, cruelty, selfishness were bad. Why? Well, because, you know, believing that violence, cruelty and selfishness are good, that, that did not promote reproductive success among our ancestors. Among our ancestors, you know, human beings, they're a, they're a social species, they require cooperation. So in that sort of, in that environment, in, in the environment where cooperation promotes survival and reproduction, obviously we come to develop pro-attitudes towards cooperative behavior um, and because that's what promotes survival and reproduction uh, so the and 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 that has nothing to do with like what the moral truths are uh, it's just a matter of what promotes survival and reproduction and so it should be obvious I mean or at least we can you know come up with fairly obvious stories about how this might apply to a case such as baby torture Human beings are a highly social species, and human babies are dependent on adults for a very long period of time. They're dependent on their, period, on their parents for a long period of time. Parents have to make significant sacrifices just to keep their children alive. I mean, raising children is extremely costly. But of course, you have to pay that cost in order to have any chance of reproductive success. So obviously there's very strong selective pressure for people to have special concern for children for people to see children as objects of care and concern. Now, I mean, you know, that's a highly simplified story, but, you know, the thought is, well, a story along these lines is going to be what explains our revulsion to baby torture. The moral facts just have nothing to do with it. Um, like, the, the revulsion to baby torture is because... Like, the, the reason why we have that revulsion um, is because you know, this is a product of a sort of attitude that promoted survival and reproduction in the past. Okay, so if an anti-realist is attracted to the evolutionary debunking argument, they're going to claim that we just have no way of identifying what the objective moral facts would be. Um, w so we, we'd have no way to tell whether... So it, even if we were to accept that there are objective moral facts, we would have no way to tell whether or not torturing babies is objectively wrong. On this view, it's just as probable, given our evidence, that torturing babies is objectively morally acceptable. The relevant evidence here is that our moral beliefs are not a product of, um, you know, they're, they're a product, our moral beliefs, you know, are not sort of tracking the moral facts, right? Our, our moral beliefs are a product of selective pressures that are not sensitive to the moral facts. Um, so yes, I mean, of course, we have this very strong revulsion to baby torture. We have a strong intuition that baby torture is wrong. And we've developed, you know, moral theories that are in line with our moral intuitions. But the whole point of the evolutionary debunking argument is that it um, kind of, it's supposed to completely undercut our confidence um, that any of our sort of moral intuitions are pointing in the right direction. Um, like maybe the moral facts are just something completely weird and unexpected maybe it's that baby torture is actually morally fine right like this is th this is what is suggested by the evolutionary debunking argument so you know this is going to be one way of of resisting um premise four right um the so it, it's going to be a way of trying to show that even if it were to turn out that moral realism is true um well, we still wouldn't be able to say, we still can't say that we have some reason to think that um, baby torture is morally wrong because, you know, so we can't, we can't say that we have some reason to think that torturing babies is objectively morally wrong because even if we were to it would turn out that moral realism is true, well, we would just have no idea what the moral facts actually are. Um, and so this is, what, this is one way to make that claim, is to appeal to evolutionary debunking arguments. It's not the only way. Um, I mean, and, and anti so one thing an anti another thing an anti-realist could say is that the very notion of objective moral norms is in some way maybe incoherent, or, or at least, you know, the notion of objective moral norms is just, that notion is just so strange 
so you know queer to use J.L. Mackey's terminology that um, when we ask what the content of these objective moral norms would be were such norms to exist we are considering you know very bizarre worlds perhaps even outright impossible worlds and we just aren't in any position to determine what such worlds would be like what the content of such norms would be so you might make that kind of argument as well um but okay um okay so that was the uh, the anti-torture argument and um you know as i said there seems to be some ways um anti-realists might resist uh this argument but let's um let's move on <clears throat> okay so, so far, Humer claims to have established that we have a reason to avoid torturing babies. And that reason is, is, is supposed to arise from the probabilistic reasons principle. Now, we now come to the third step of the argument, which is going to show that the reason to avoid torturing babies is an objective moral reason. So, what was stated in premise 5, um, that, that, that claim in premise 5 that we have a reason to avoid torturing babies. Um, in this third step of the argument, humour is going to show that this is an objective moral reason. Again, an anti-realist can accept premise five. An anti-realist can accept that we have a reason to avoid torturing babies. Um, they're just not going to see it as being, you know, an objective moral reason. But uh, Hume, this step of the argument is going to try to show that. So here's the argument. Um, premise six. The premises of the anti-torture argument are independent of interests, desires, and attitudes, in the sense that's relevant to moral realism, at least. Premise 7. The premises of the anti-torture argument logically entail its conclusion. Premise 8. If P is independent of interests, desires, and attitudes, and P entails C, then C is independent of interests, desires, and attitudes. Conclusion. So, the conclusion of the anti-torture argument is independent of interests, desires, and attitudes. And this is just to say that the conclusion of the anti-torture argument is an objective moral reason, which is to say, moral realism is true, right? The claim, we have reason to avoid torturing babies, that is true independently of anybody's interests, desires, or attitudes. So there's a reason to avoid torturing babies that's independent of interests, desires, and attitudes, which is just to say, it is a moral truth, it is an objective it is a stance-independent moral truth. Um, all right, then. So that's the that's the argument. There we go. Um, now, I think... Uh, so premise 7 and premise 8 here are relatively uncontroversial, right? So premise 7 just asserts that the anti-torture argument is logically valid. Uh, probably the anti-realist isn't going to dispute this. Um, the anti-torture argument is just a straightforward application of the probabilistic reasons principle. Um... What about premise eight here? Why accept premise eight? So the claim that if P is independent of interest, desires, and attitudes, and P entails C, then C is independent of interest, desires, and attitudes. Well, <clears throat> suppose that C uh, is dependent on interests, desires, or attitudes. Then if those interests, desires, or attitudes did not obtain, C would be false, obviously. But if P entails C, then whenever C is false, P must be false as well. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's just an application of modus tollens, right? Like, if P, then C, not C, therefore not P. So, if P entails C, then whenever C is false, P must be false as well. But then, that would just be to say that if those interests, desires, and attitudes did not obtain, P would be false. Um, so, yeah, so, so if C is dependent on interests, then if those interests did not obtain, C would be false. Okay, but P entails C, then whenever C is false, P must be false as well. So if the interest did not obtain, P would be false. Which would, of course, just be to say that P actually is dependent on interests, desires, attitudes after all. So this shows then that if P is stance independent and P entails C, then C must be stance independent as well. Okay, so, um, you know, as, you know, as I said, that's probably uncontroversial. I mean, the, the, the question really here is probably going to arise around uh, premise six, the claim that the premises of the anti-torture argument are independent of interests, desires and attitudes. Um, why should we believe this? Well, if you go back to the anti-torture argument um, and 
just have a look at those premises, then um, hopefully you can see why. So let's start with premise one, which asserts the probabilistic reasons principle. As we have seen, Humer presents this as a general principle of practical rationality. It's necessarily true, true in all circumstances, no matter what your desires and interests actually are, or even if you have no desires and interests, the conditional claim asserted by the probabilistic reasons principle is still true. So if knowing that P would give you a reason to do X and knowing that not P would not in itself give you a reason not to do X, then the mere chance of P being true gives you some reason to do X. That's the case regardless of what your actual interests are. You know, regardless of what your goals actually are, this, this general principle is supposed to, you know, is supposed to bind you, right? Like this, because this principle is going to guide you in the right kind of way with respect to achieving your goals. Again, regardless of what those goals actually are. That's the claim, at least. We've also seen that Humer thinks that premise two is true by definition, in which case it's true independent of desires and interests. Premise three is probably uncontroversial. Premise four, Humer claims, is true given the current state of metaethics and ethics. And, I mean, again, really, he's sort of appealing here to a general principle of rationality. So the idea would be, well, Given the amount of dispute about moral realism among intelligent people, given that the arguments are, in, are inconclusive, um, a rational inquirer should be open to the possibility that moral realism might be true. And that's independent. This is the case independently of your desires and interests. Even if you strongly desire that moral realism is false, well, the fact that there are strong considerations in favour of it... Um, the fact that there are plenty of intelligent people who have thought more carefully about it, you know, the fact that those people believe it, these facts mean that you should still be open to the possibility it might be true. Um, it would be irrational to reject that possibility. Um, so, uh, so, 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 yeah, I mean, again, this is kind of a, a more sort of general principle of rationality. Um, the, the underlying principle here is that when there is some sort of position which is open to a lot of debate, which is controversial among the experts, then rational inquirers um, should not, that they should at least have a kind of non-zero epistemic possibility for that, uh, epistemic probability for that position. Um, and then, you know, if moral realism is true, well, torturing babies is going to be objectively morally wrong. So we have some reason independent of our desires and interests to believe that torturing babies is objectively morally wrong. Um, Okay, so so that's the that's the idea. Um, I mean, we've already seen that there are, for instance, you know, so there are ways of objecting to the anti-torture argument. There are interpretations of reason on which the premises of the anti-torture argument actually don't come out as being true, independent of desires and interests. More generally, it's worth noting that one strategy open to the anti-realist here is to deny that the probabilistic reasons principle is, in fact, objective. Um, the, the probabilistic reasons principle is a principle of sort of practical rationality, or maybe just a principle of rationality in general. It applies not just to moral norms, but also to prudential norms. Um, but, you know, we might be anti-realists about uh, practical reason in general, about not just moral norms, but also prudential norms. In fact, we might be anti-realist about all reasons and normativity. We um, we might deny that there are any stance-independent norms, whether they be moral norms, practical norms, epistemic norms, whatever. Of course, this means committing to a more extreme form of anti-realism, but some anti-realists um, do take this more extreme line. Hello, I take that more extreme line. Okay, so some anti-realists do take that more extreme line. Um, but uh, the so, so the probabilistic reasons principle, it specifies a relation between reasons for belief and then reasons for action. It says, you know, if these conditions, if conditions A, B and C hold, you have a reason to perform action X. But then, okay, why would we accept that, um, why should we think that it stands independently true that if A, B and C hold, you thereby have a reason to perform action X? Maybe this is true only given some set of evaluative attitudes. So if I have a positive attitude towards maximizing expected utility. If my aim is to maximize expected utility, then I might take the probabilistic reasons principle to be a useful guide to action. Um, I mean, it's worth noting that although the probabilistic reasons principle tells us the conditions under which we have reason to do something, it doesn't in itself say that this reason is objective. 
Um, you know, it just the conclusion is just you have a reason to do X. Um, it doesn't in itself. So the probabilistic reasons principle doesn't in itself say that given these conditions, we have a stance independent reason to do anything. Um, of course, most human beings probably probably do act in accordance with something like the probabilistic reasons principle. But we might say, well, that's because most human beings, you know, they aim to satisfy their own desires. They aim to maximize expected utility and so on. Um, so, you know, so what we might say is, yes, if you have a kind of positive attitude towards these things or if you aim if your aim is to do these sorts of things um maximizing expected utility satisfying one's own desires um then the probabilistic reasons principle will be true but it will be stance dependently true it's true only given um your attitudes uh, so from from this point of view the probabilistic reasons principle does not hold independently of our desires and interests an alternative way of um denying that the principle is stance independently true is to say that it's not actually true at all. We might say that the probabilistic reasons principle is just false. Um, so even if conditions A, B and C hold, it's not true that you have a reason to do X. And we might say this because we might say that there just are no reasons, or at least there are no reasons in the relevant sense. This is the kind of line that an error theorist might take. So an error theorist might say, yeah, sure, our standard conception of rationality presupposes that the probabilistic reasons principle is an objective norm, but there are no objective norms, so the probabilistic reasons principle is false. You know, the most that can be said is, if you care about, you know, maximizing expected utility or something along those lines, then thinking in terms of the probabilistic reasons principle will help you satisfy that goal. But, you know, that's it. That doesn't give you a reason to do anything because there just are no reasons. Um, so, you know, I mean, these are, uh, again, for, for anti-realists who are attracted to, or anti-realists who are willing to embrace a more extreme form of anti-realism about normativity, um, those are some options. You know, you might say, well, the probabilistic reasons principle is merely stance independently true, or it's just not true at all. Um, so I mean, one kind of, <clears throat> I guess, general point here is we might deploy Hume's ontological argument as part of um, a kind of companions in guilt style argument. Um, so I, I have a video on the companions in guilt arguments, which I will link in the comments. Um, but, the, but the thought is then we, we might say, well, look, um, if you believe that there are objective practical reasons or objective epistemic reasons, then you're going to be committed to objective moral reasons, right? The, the ontological argument can show you how to go from you know, objective prudential norms and how you can go from that to an objective moral norm. Um, and, and there are moral anti-realists who accept objective prudential reasons, objective epistemic reasons, but then they deny that there are objective moral reasons. So this argument might well raise some trouble for them. Um, I mean, as I said, there are also anti-realists who just deny objective reasons across the board. Uh, so, you know, I, maybe that doesn't raise quite so much trouble for those ones. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's worth noting that, yeah, maybe this could be, be used um, as part of a broader sort of companions and guilt strategy, um, at least for those anti-realists who, uh, who buy into objective prudential norms or objective epistemic norms or whatever. Um, OK, well, uh, that is... That is the end of that. That is Humer's ontological argument for moral realism. I hope you found that interesting and um, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.